It is, again, my privilege to be with you tonight. Uh, this is my second day in Bekolod. For those of you who were, who were here last night, uh, I mentioned that I had just flew in to Bekolod yesterday morning. So this is day two for me. Uh, this is actually day two of my having ever been in the Philippines, actually. This is my first time to the Philippines. And I am enjoying it so much. Um, it's my privilege to be with you here and share on some, what are you know, very common and important health topics. And so it's my privilege to share um, what I know about them with you and also answer some questions. Uh, there were some questions that were submitted yesterday and as I was looking at them, I thought, you know, uh, for the individuals who submitted the questions, I was thinking, oh, they read my mind. <laughs> because some of the questions are going to be about uh, some topics related to cancer that I will be sharing tonight. Uh, one of the questions was about, you know, what foods cause cancer? Uh, which is, you know, a great question, a very practical question. And I hope in the rest of tonight's presentation to try to answer uh, that question as well as some others. Um, I want to apologize to my hosts because um, I am going to be speaking about epigenetics, uh, but because I was not able to finish my presentation last night, on cancer, I would like to, with your permission, finish that tonight um, because there's some very important information uh, in there that I have not yet shared with you. So with your permission, um, tonight I will be finishing the discussion on epigenetics and then, or I'm sorry, on cancer, and then tomorrow night we will be talking about epigenetics. Okay, so for those of you who were here last night, I just want to give a brief summary to refresh your memory about what we talked about uh, regarding cancer so far. Uh, so we talked about what is cancer. And if you remember, uh, one of the definition was that cancer is uh, the uncontrolled growth of cells. So normally, our cells know uh, how to grow. They know... Uh, where to grow, you know, what part of the body, and they know for how long they need to grow, and also they appropriately know when to stop growing. And as you know, eventually cells die too. You know, they have a, a certain amount of life, and then when they are done, they die. But cancer cells are not like this. Cancer cells have uncontrolled growth. Uh, they don't know when to stop growing or where to stop growing. So. Uh, we talked about this as being the definition of cancer. Uh, and then we talked a little bit, if you remember, about, you know, what are the risk factors for cancer? We talked about the fact that um, almost 70 to 90 percent of the risk factors for cancer um, are external, external factors, meaning many times we can control them, which is good news because that means that cancer is not just something you get because you have bad luck. You know, most of the risk for cancer in most cases uh, are factors in our environment or in our lifestyle that we can control. So that was good news. And then we talked a little bit about, uh, we started to talk about the genes associated with cancer. Uh, and this is where we talked about good genes, and if you remember this last slide, we talked about oncogenes. So oncogenes are type of genes that will promote the development of cancer. So we don't want those genes to be active, uh, because obviously if they're active, then we will have more risk for cancer. I think actually this was our last slide last night. We talked about what does cancer need to grow? And there are many factors, but I wanted to highlight two of them. So one of them was angiogenesis. And we talked about angio meaning blood vessels, and genesis meaning the beginning or new. So new blood vessels. Because in order for cancer to keep growing, it needs a continuing blood supply uh, so that it can keep growing, and oxygen. And then the other thing we talked about was Cancer needs an inflammatory environment. And you know, over the next several days, as we continue to talk about 
other diseases like heart disease and diabetes and Alzheimer's disease, you're going to keep hearing me talk about inflammation. You're going to say, oh, she talked about inflammation before, you know, with another disease. So you will see that many of these very important diseases in modern society um, have uh, a great link in inflammation. These are just a few quotes uh, from some scientific journals. Um, it's well established now that there are important connections between cancer and inflammation. This is not just my saying so. Um, I'm just going to highlight a few of them. Uh, the first one says, it is now well established that the induction of inflammation by bacterial and viral infection increases cancer risk. So in this statement, it has another interesting link. The link uh, is concerning bacterial and viral infections. And so if you think about this, can you think of any bacterial or viral infections that can increase the risk of cancer? I just think about it for a minute. Um, some of the common ones uh, to bring to, you, to your attention would be ones like hepatitis B. Have any of you heard of hepatitis B? Hepatitis B is a virus, and it's most commonly uh, a virus that causes infections in the liver. Uh, in some cases, you are born with hepatitis B through transmission you know, from mother to child, and sometimes you can uh, obtain hepatitis B during your lifetime, even if you're not born with it. But if someone has chronic hepatitis B infection, uh, over time that can cause continuing inflammation, sometimes over years in people, and that can increase your risk for uh, cancer of the liver or liver cancer. So that's one example where this chronic uh, inflammation from this chronic infection can increase the risk of cancer. Uh, and there are other examples as well. Uh, for the interest of time, I won't go into them, but just to illustrate that you have this link between inflammation and cancer. Okay, so some, some years ago, Time Magazine had an article, and you can see here in the title, The Secret Killer. So what was the secret killer? The secret killer was inflammation. And so it actually talks about how inflammation is linked, as we talked about, to heart disease, Alzheimer's disease or dementia and cancer, uh, as well as some other major diseases we talked about. All right. <laughs> Next, uh, this is a slide with you know, many different uh, things on it. The main thing I want to show you uh, in this slide is this is actually a picture of um, the lining of the intestine. So, uh, you know, in your digestive system, you have your stomach and then you have your small intestine and your large intestine. So, this is actually a picture. If you look on your left side of the picture, uh, you will see, let me see if I can use my laser pointer. Uh, this works. Okay, it's not working. But you can see on the left side, kind of in this groove, you can see uh, little green, <laughs> long um, uh, organisms that are labeled bacteria. And so what this is showing is that sometimes in your intestines, you have unfriendly bacteria. We have a lot of friendly bacteria in our intestines. But sometimes you will get unfriendly bacteria, and they can cause inflammation uh, in the intestines, also in the stomach. And what can happen is if you have too much inflammation over time in this area, it can lead to what you see on the right side, which is uh, the beginning of cancer. You know? So um, this is illustrating that inflammation can eventually lead to cancer, even in places like the intestines. And then we also talked about uh, tumor uh, angiogenesis. We were just talking about the development of new blood vessels. So this is an illustration of what it can look like um, and why, again, cancer cells need new blood vessels. You know, they need oxygen, 
they need blood supply, they need energy, which is all delivered through new blood vessels. And you know, one of the targets sometimes in treatment for cancer is to try to cut off the blood supply of cancer cells. Okay, so next, I want to talk to you about one of my favorite stories about cancer. Um, this is a cute story because it's a story about a mouse, <laughs> but it's a very powerful story, so I want to tell it to you. Um, this is a story of super mouse. And I don't know if you've ever heard this story. This is not a famous story in cancer circles, but as I said, it's a very powerful story. In 2003, so it's a little bit old, but still very relevant, uh, in the United States, in Wake Forest University, um, researchers there uh, published a paper uh, which has been looked at over and over over the years. It was called the Spontane Spontaneous Regression of advanced cancer. Now, if you just read the title of that paper, it's kind of exciting. So spontaneous, right? That means it just happened by itself. You know, there was no treatment, just cancer went away. And not just cancer, but advanced cancer. So for me, even the title of that article would make me very curious. So. The way that this article came about was, so the scientists who published the article, they did not even expect these results from this mouse. But this one mouse, later named Super Mouse, in some circles they call this mouse Mighty Mouse. <laughs> but either way, this was a very amazing mouse as far as the understanding of cancer goes. So this mouse, along with many other similar mice, uh, was undergoing an experiment where they injected each mouse with, I think my understanding is 500,000 very strong cancer cells. The names of the cancer cells were called S180 uh, cells. Um, for those of you who are in the medical profession, I think that the S stood for sarcoma. And sarcoma is a very aggressive cancer in itself. So. Uh, the scientists knew when they were injecting these mice with, this, with these cancer cells that the mice uh, would likely um, get cancer. And that was their goal. Uh, they, they expected the mice to get cancer. The symptoms of getting cancer would be that um, the mice would develop a very big belly. And the reason they would develop a large belly it would almost be like they were pregnant, but they were not, would be because their bellies would be full of fluid. Uh, the, the name of the fluid was acidic fluid, uh, which was a result of the cancer. So um, they were doing a study on these mice for a different reason, uh, but what was interesting was all of the mice that they injected with the 500,000 cancer cells um, got cancer. They all got big bellies, and they died about two weeks after they had the injections. But one mouse, you know, out of all of these mice, many mice, didn't get the expected symptoms. His belly didn't get big, he was fine. And he did not die after two weeks. So the scientists thought, you know, why is this mouse you know, not developing cancer? You know, all the other mouse, mice had died, and so they thought, well, maybe we made a mistake. Maybe when we injected this mouse, this mouse didn't receive you know, the full amount of cancer cells. So they injected the mouse again. <laughs> and this time, they injected the mouse with two million uh, cells, two million of these cancer cells. And the mouse still did not get cancer, no signs of cancer. So, do you know what they did? They injected it again <laughs> with another two million cancer cells and still nothing. And they thought there is something strange about this mouse. So they did it one more time. So this is four times now that they injected this mouse. And I think the last time, I think they did like two billion cancer cells or something like some huge number of cancer cells and the mouse still did not get cancer. So at this point, 
wouldn't you be extremely curious, right, about why is this mouse that they had overwhelmed with cancer cells not getting cancer? So I'm, thinking, I'm just wondering if in your minds you, are, you have some idea of why this mouse did not get cancer. So think about this, but I will tell you the answer here. So, you know, this mouse was very unique. And what they did is they said, let's take a sample of this mouse's blood. And let's see if there's anything unusual about this mouse. So they did. <laughs> and this is what they saw. They looked under video microscopy, which is, uh, just like it says, it's a real-time um, microscopy where they can look at actually the cells being alive. And what they saw was, they saw something called NK cells. NK cells, NK stands for natural killer cells. And they are part of uh, the immune system of mice, and they are also part of the immune system of people, of human beings. And they saw that this mouse had very strong natural killer cells. So one of the things that this illustrated very strongly was that our immune system is very important, actually, in our resistance to cancer, you know, in our ability to fight cancer. And this is actually a picture of this mouse's um, uh, natural killer cells and white blood cells actually fighting off the cancer. So you can see in um, in slide A, where it, this is actually the cancer cell. <laughs> and then in slide B, you can see the smaller cells. Those are actually the natural killer cells or white blood cells that are attacking the cancer cell. And then you can see in slide C that um, <laughs> in the corner there, in the right lower corner, you can see that uh, one of these uh, white blood cells or natural killer cells is pretty much uh, destroying the cancer cell. And in slide D, what you see is uh, the cancer cell is dying. So this was kind of amazing proof for the scientists that this mouse had very strong immune cells or white blood cells. So with that, uh, I want to talk briefly about the human immune system. You know, the human immune system is amazing. You know, when I studied this in school, I was just like, this is so amazing. <laughs> and um, I was just so grateful that, uh, you know, when I thought of this, I thought, wow, God has made the human body in such an amazing way. Um, you know, he has given us, if we can take care of our bodies, um, ample tools and a defense system to try to protect ourselves from disease. So in our immune system, uh, you can break it up into different ways, but two ways are you have your innate immune system and then you have your adaptive immune system. Your in innate immune system, which includes those natural killer cells that were seen with the mouse, the innate immune system um, is the body's first line of immune defense. It's very important. As soon as something uh, such as a type of uh, organism that can cause infection or cancer cells, anything foreign that comes into the body, the innate immune system is the first line of defense. They are the first cells that kind of say, okay, what is this that's coming into the body? You know, what do we have to do? So um, it's the first line. And then your second line is your adaptive immune system. So this is something that we're more familiar with. This is, um, examples would be antibodies. Uh, you know, we learn about antibodies when, especially if you've had an infection and you hear about people developing antibodies. Um, these are, the adaptive immune system is specific to specific types of infections. So let's say that, you know, one, one day you got uh, the flu, influenza. And your body, uh, over time, over a few days, will start to develop antibodies. And hopefully you don't get the flu again, but if your body is introduced 
to influenza cells, um, such as you had previously, it will remember. It will say, I remember you had the flu one year ago. <laughs> and so it knows how to fight those influenza cells. Uh, so there's advantages and disadvantages to different types uh, of the immune system, but they work together. And so the main thing is that we need to try to keep both parts of our immune system strong. Uh, just very briefly, I wanted to show you just kind of a cartoon of some of the different cells of the immune system. So on the left side, you will see the some of the different cells of the innate immune system. On the right side, you'll see some of the adaptive immune systems. So on the right side, you see the antibodies. And then on the left side, you see uh, different cells. You can see uh, among them being the natural killer cells. So now that we've started talking about these natural killer cells with our story about super mouse, you may be thinking, so how do I increase my natural killer cells? Like, what do I need to do? So there are a few ways. Um, there's many ways, actually, but here's just a few of them that I want to introduce to you. Some of these I'm introducing because uh, they were part of certain studies that were done. And I found some of this information very fascinating when I was researching it. Okay, so one was um, walking taking a walk. We all know that exercise is good for us, but what was really interesting was that um, they actually looked at uh, humans walking in a forest versus walking in the city. Now, you know, I, because this is my first time in Bacolod, I don't know if you have forest here, but if you don't have forest, I think the equivalent would be like if you are walking in kind of like a natural area, you know, where there's not a lot of buildings and things like that. So I think that would be kind of a similar environment. So they looked at, and I'm just gonna go to the next slide. They actually looked at, scientists looked at people walking in the forest and they looked at people like walking just in the city. And one of the things they found, I thought this was amazing, was that walking in a forest increases your natural killer activity. And so I thought, why is that, you know? What is special about, you know, walking in a forest? So uh, I know the, the print here is small, but they actually said that the air in a forest has certain special chemicals. Some of these chemicals may be released from the trees or the plants, um, but it has special chemicals which help us uh, you know, protect our bodies from cancer. And I thought, wow, that is amazing. The article mentions uh, some of the names of them. Uh, one of them, one of the names of these chemicals is called perforin, P-E-R-F-O-R-I-N. And when I researched what perforin was, it's actually a chemical that is uh, secreted by our natural killer cells and other white blood cells, it actually will poke holes in cancer cells to help destroy them. And I thought, wow, that is amazing. <laughs> you know, here is this chemical that you just breathe in the air that helps you destroy cancer cells. Uh, there was another one called granulolysin. So a very similar chemical, actually, again, a chemical released by your immune cells also that would poke holes uh, in the wall of cancer cells to help destroy it. So I thought, wow, that's one of the reasons it's very beneficial for us to, of course, one, be active and exercise, but if possible, uh, to try to be active in kind of a natural environment. Now I know, you know, we have busy lives, all of us are busy, but I would say maybe on a weekend, if you are off, you're not working, you, maybe you can go to a, a place in nature and just breathe in some nice, you know, natural air. And that could help you in some way to uh, increase your protection against cancer. Okay, another way here is to eat blueberries. Now, I'm going to pass over this because um, this particular slide I did make for an American audience. I know blueberries are not uh, probably a common food here in the Philippines. But the point of 
of blueberries is blueberries are high in antioxidants. And so uh, I know in the Philippines you're blessed with having many wonderful fruits here and vegetables. So um, the equivalent here in the Philippines would be to eat fruits and vegetables that have a very high antioxidant content. Um, also, the same principle goes along with eating foods high in vitamin C, E, and beta carotene. All of those are designed, all of these are um, high antioxidant uh, nutrients. And so antioxidants definitely help protect us uh, from cancer. The other one I'm going to highlight is limiting the use of oil in cooking. And I want to show you um, this um, abstract of an article. So the title is Inhibition of Natural Killer Cell Activity by Dietary Lipids. So they did a study where they had people eat um, a variety of different oils in their diet. Um, they had them eat, among other oils, um, olive oil. They had them eat coconut oil, fish oil, etc. And as they ate these oils, they checked their antioxidant levels and their natural killer cell levels. What they found was that for actually all of the oils they tested, um, when uh, individuals consume these oils, um, their natural killer cell activity went down. Now, I think this article is not saying to not eat oils at all. I think that would be somewhat impractical. But I think what the article is trying to emphasize is uh, probably don't consume too much oil, you know, because that can, if you consume quite a bit of oil, it can decrease your natural, kill, uh, natural killer cell activity. Okay, now here is another way to increase your natural killer cell activity. We all know that exercise is good for you. This is something that I think is not disputed, but you know, there are actually uh, articles and research out there talking about that just uh, very modest exercise can increase your natural killer cell activity. Uh, in this particular article that I cited here, they found a link um, decreasing stomach cancer uh, in patients who exercised. Okay, so let's look quickly. This is from the World Health Organization. They looked at what are the major uh, behavioral and dietary risk factors for cancer. So all of these are risk factors that we can control, so, which I think is a good thing because we have some control over this. So one is high body mass index. So you know you want to try to be at your um, ideal body mass index, height and weight. Uh, another risk factor is low fruit and vegetable intake. So you know that fruits and vegetables are good for you. Uh, we all know that, but when you have low intake of those, you can increase your risk for cancer. The third one is physical inactivity. You know, we just saw the slide that said exercise increases your natural killer cells. And then tobacco use and alcohol use. So I know you all have heard of the dangers of alcohol and tobacco, and I'm actually going to talk about that a little bit more. So these modifiable risk factors, if we can improve on these, we can significantly decrease our risk for cancer. Now, you have heard about antioxidants. I have started to mention those a little bit. So what, what are they? You know, why are they important? Why do we keep saying, you know, eat foods that are high in antioxidants? So one of the important things about antioxidants is that they stabilize something in our bodies called free radicals. So what are free radicals? So one thing we know about free radicals is that they decrease, uh, or sorry, antioxidants decrease DNA damage from free radicals. Now, one example I like to give about what a free radical is, is um, this is kind of an unfortunate example, but I think it's a good analogy. But um, in the United States, again, very unfortunately, kind of in recent times, we have a lot of people who, how can I say, use guns unwisely. You know, you hear about these people who are, you know, we've, you know, you might think, well, it must be crazy, but they will just 
go into a school uh, or a public place and just start shooting people, you know, for no reason. And so you can almost make an analogy. But people like this, you know, they go in, they start just shooting people they don't even know randomly. Um, you can kind of compare them to free radicals. So free radicals are these unstable um, chemicals in the body that can cause DNA damage. You can, you can think of it as um, they're unstable, they come in contact with DNA, and you can kind of say they start shooting almost. They start damaging DNA, you know, so that um, th obviously that is not a good thing. And as we talked about at the beginning of our cancer presentation, um, if DNA is damaged, what happens to the cell is, if it's working correctly, either you repair the damage or the cell has to die. So the less that we can, um, or the less we damage DNA, the more we can protect DNA, the, the better. So antioxidants, our kind of protection against this free radical damage to DNA. And some examples, there are many, many examples, but some of them include some of the vitamins, A, vitamin A, vitamin C, and vitamin E are some of the uh, vitamins that are known antioxidants. So one question sometimes I get is, well, maybe I should eat like lots of vitamins and supplements just to make sure <laughs> that I get enough. And so, what do you think? Do you think we should eat lots of vitamins? You know, we should go to the store and buy lots of vitamins. Well, uh, here is one study to kind of partially give you the answer to this. So they did a study where they uh, gave beta carotene supplements to um, patients in the study. The beta carotene is actually the pigment or the chemical that causes, you know, kind of the orange or red color in many foods, like carrots and um, yams even, um, and other kinds of red or orange vegetables. And it's also a precursor to vitamin A. Now, what they saw though was, even though they gave beta carotene to these uh, patients, they found it actually did not protect from cancer. It actually increased the risk of certain cancers like lung cancer. So what they saw is, okay, so this is not a good thing to give beta carotene supplements. They also found that when they gave the beta carotene supplements, the vitamin E levels were decreased in the body from these beta carotene supplements. So the advice I generally give is, it's not really a, uh, an ideal thing to depend on taking a lot of supplements to you know, protect yourself uh, or to get you know, enough antioxidants. The best thing, if possible, is to eat a wide variety of fruits and vegetables, just a very balanced diet, and you should be able to get you know, the nutrients you need from a well-balanced diet. But the key is, again, it has to be well-balanced. <clears throat> now, this slide, again, it was for more for an American audience. I am going to talk about some specific uh, fruits and vegetables native to the Philippines. But I wanted to show you this picture anyway, because one key thing is that, you know, when you're thinking about, like, so which fruits should I eat? Or which vegetables should I eat? You know, do I have to memorize uh, a list in my brain? <laughs> or, or, you know, several lists. So you do not. But here's a few easy principles. So one of them is, um, I would encourage you, don't eat the same thing every day. You know, even if you love, let's say, mangoes, don't only eat mangoes. You know, eat a variety of fruits and eat a variety of vegetables. And then one other thing is, try to eat um, what we say sometimes is eat the rainbow, <laughs> meaning eat lots of different colors. So I wanted to show you this slide just to illustrate. It's nice to eat something red, something blue, something orange, you know, something yellow. So if you eat a variety of colors, um, it's pretty, but not just is it pretty, but all those colors represent different types of nutrients. So this is one way you can know, you know, am I getting enough antioxidants? Am I getting enough nutrients? 
um, eat a variety of colors. Uh, the same is true for vegetables. Again, these are more vegetables in the US. I know you have some of these too here. But again, even for vegetables, try to eat a variety of colors in your vegetables. Um, you know, even our vegetables have many different colors. Okay, so here we have, um, I actually saw an article about this um, in uh, one of our, uh, I forgot where I found this, but it was in one of our, I think, Filipino medical websites. And it was entitled, Six of the Best Fruits and Vegetables of the Philippines. I just wanted to share this with you. <laughs> so you have avocado. So avocado, you know, we have this in the U.S. as well. Avocado is a great, you know, you might, some, there's maybe some debate. You can consider fruit, maybe you would consider vegetable. <laughs> but regardless, this is a great food, avocado. Avocado is high in monosaturated fat. Um, actually, monosaturated fat is a healthy fat. So this is a good thing. Uh, and actually uh, protects against certain types of cancer. Uh, it's high in potassium. Uh, and so it's a very good uh, food here. Buko, young coconut. Actually, um, you all know the benefits of coconut. Um, I have a personal experience uh, eating coconut in the US. Uh, many years ago, I had a kind of minor problem, but still for me a problem with my thyroid. I had some hormonal issue. And I had a physician, even though I'm a physician, I still consulted a physician who said to me, you know, you should eat coconut. And that will help to like regulate your hormonal balance. And I found a lot of benefit actually in taking coconut. Uh, papaya. So papaya is a, a fruit very common here in the Philippines. Uh, papaya has some extremely, as you probably know, some wonderful, strong, uh, and very beneficial enzymes, enzymes for digestion, uh, you know, and many other benefits. Uh, eggplant. So eggplant, I was very interested in finding this out. I did not know this until I did some research. It has some unique chemicals. Chlorogenic acid and nasunin, these are actually anti-cancer chemicals. Uh, nasunin actually is an anti-angiogenic uh, chemical that's found in eggplant. You remember that one of the uh, factors that cancer needs to grow is, is angiogenesis. So nasunin here is angiogenic or anti-angiogenic. So this could actually be very beneficial food in certain types of cancers. And then you have moringa or malungai. So I've learned a little bit about uh, moringa. And you know what I've read is that moringa is like this miracle vegetable. And so I need to learn more about it. But from what I've read, um, and you probably know more about this too, but apparently Moringa is beneficial in so many different types of diseases. I mean, I just saw a long list of diseases that Moringa is beneficial for. And, and then finally, sweet potato. So sweet potato is also one of those foods uh, high in vitamin A and beta carotene. So it has good antioxidant value. and you know, someone said to me, I have not checked this, someone said, if you're ever stranded on an island and you have nothing to eat, if you can eat sweet potatoes, that will give you like all the nutrients you need for like a long time. And I don't know if that's true, but someone did say that to me. Uh, here are some other foods with anti-cancer properties. Again, these are not the only ones. I just am highlighting a few. Um, turmeric. I know that you use turmeric here in the Philippines. And in the U.S., um, turmeric is also becoming more and more famous as an anti-inflammatory food, very, um, very strong anti-inflammatory action, and also as an anti-cancer food. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but um, many athletes uh, who are even amateur athletes and professional athletes will take turmeric because, you know, a lot of them train very hard and you know, we'll have inflammation after their training. They'll have sore muscles and be tired after their training and they will take turmeric to recover. Mushrooms. So um, I will say the, um, the Japanese especially are very uh, heavily involved in research as far as mushrooms and their uh, anti-cancer properties. 
Uh, mushrooms contain uh, a certain type of chemical called lentinin. And actually, in Japan, they extract this chemical from mushrooms and use it in anti-cancer treatment. Um, I mentioned pomegranates. Um, again, this is, I know, probably not native to uh, the Philippines. But again, the principle is foods with high antioxidant content, bright yellow foods, soy is, is actually an anti-cancer uh, food, and then seaweed. Um, seaweed is one of those unique foods that has special uh, benefits as far as stimulating natural killer cell function. Okay, the number one thing that you should avoid to decrease your risk of cancer, what do you think it is? Then if you could only do one thing to decrease your risk of cancer, just one thing, <laughs> nothing else. What do you think it is? Okay. Okay, it's to not smoke. <laughs> so if you smoke, to stop smoking. If you don't smoke, to not start smoking. That's the number one thing, uh, if there was nothing else. So I think everyone in the room here knows that smoking is not good for you. It has men, smoking, um, imbues many risk factors for cancer. Um, there are just some of them on here. So it's not just lung cancer, as you can see. It's pancreatic cancer, colon cancer, and anywhere that the smoke um, comes in contact with. So it's not just the lungs, it's the lips, the mouth, the throat, this whole area where the smoke goes down, essentially, uh, and including the pancreas and colon. Now, um, another thing is <laughs> carcinogen called benzopyrene that I want to talk to you about. Now, benzopyrene is a chemical which is a carcinogen. A carcinogen, um, as you probably know, carcinogen is basically any substance that contributes to the increased risk of cancer, that can cause cancer. So benz benzopyrene is one of these chemicals. Benzopyrene is found in charcoal grilled meats. Now, I know some of you are thinking, but I love, you know, charcoal grilled meats or barbecue. <laughs> so, um, but honestly, it increases the risk of tumors of the large intestine, of the colon. And this, this was a very direct connection they saw. So, the other thing is benzopyrene is found in charcoal grilled meats and also in cigarettes and uh, this cancer-causing chemical. So you can see two pounds of steak, uh, if you grill it, it's the equivalent of benzopyrene found in 600 cigarettes. So that's a lot of cigarettes. So I know some of you are thinking, but it tastes so good. <laughs> but I just want you to think about, um, but it can cause cancer too, you know. All right, so you may not have thought about what actually is in tobacco smoke when someone smokes or when you breathe in secondhand smoke. But there are a host of uh, cancer causing or cancer potentiating chemicals. These are just some of them. Um, but you can see in here, um, there, these are um, things that you don't want to be inhaling on a regular basis. The other thing I want to bring to your attention is alcohol is also a carcinogen. Um, again, carcinogen is a, a cancer-causing or, or contributing to cancer substance. Uh, this, is, this was made very clear by actually many reports. Uh, the World Health Organization has commented on this. Um, the IARC, this is the IARC, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, this is actually a subdivision of the World Health Organization. So they very early, back in 1988, first talked about how alcohol was a cancer-causing substance. And, you know, you will hear from time to time, well, but isn't, you know, red wine okay? For example, one glass of red wine, because that helps to decrease your risk of heart disease, um, you know, et cetera. So I would say this. Um, there are substances that, you know, might have small benefit in one area, 
and then negative benefit in another area. I would say alcohol, you know, or red wine in this case is one of those. You know, you can make an argument that there may be a small benefit for heart disease if you drink a glass of wine a day. But let's say in your genetic makeup, you have some propensity, you have some risk for cancer. Maybe in your family, uh, there is a history of breast cancer or prostate cancer or other types of cancer. You know, you have to weigh the risks of that. You have to think, you know, is the small benefit worth the risk of cancer? So there's are just some things that you have to weigh. They actually did a study about light alcohol drinking. So they said, well, maybe if you drink a little bit, just one drink, you know, per day. And this article is actually from the Annals of Oncology. So this is a, a cancer medical journal. And they looked at, you know, maybe it's okay to just drink a little bit. Maybe it's only if you drink a lot that you will increase your risk of cancer. What they found was even light drinking increased the risk of several cancers, among them being breast cancer, cancer of the, uh, the head and neck, they called it, uh, and breast cancer, as I mentioned. Okay, so next, I want to talk to you a little bit about immunotherapy. Uh, and the reason I want to talk to you about this, so these are more conventional cancer treatments. We talked about the importance of, you know, your diet, and also avoiding certain substances, as we just said, um, tobacco and alcohol. But um, I want to show you how important having a strong immune system is to fighting your, and decreasing your risk of cancer. And the way I want to do that partially is to talk to you about one of the new emerging treatments for cancer. It's a field called immunotherapy. It's very fascinating. So how does immunotherapy work? Just the name itself says that it somehow is using your immune system, right? Uh, and so this is how it works. So on the left side you see that, um, or on the right side here, this kind of fuzzy purple looking thing is a tumor cell, a cancer cell. And on each left side you see a T cell. So a T cell is one of your immune cells in your body. Um, and so it's an immune cell that could potentially help, you know, kill, you know, if possible, the tumor cell or the cancer cell. But, you know, cancer cells can be very tricky. And what they do is they, they have little mechanisms to turn off the activity of your immune cell, of your white blood cells. And so that's what the left side is showing, is that a lot of times the cancer cells will come and, and almost try to make friends with your, two, with your T cells or other immune cells and say, you know, you don't wanna harm me, you don't wanna bother me, and so it just turns it off. And then your T cell uh, is not able to help destroy the cancer cells. So that's what you see on the left side. In immunotherapy, what happens is they, they use a drug, and I'll talk a little bit more about it, but they use a drug to prevent this problem so that your T cell, your immune cell, can be turned back on and then help destroy the cancer cell. So it's kind of fascinating. The drug is helping you reactivate your immune system. Okay, so this is kind of a complicated slide, but basically what you see is on the left side, you see the tumor cell, which is a cancer cell, and then in the middle, you see this T cell. Again, this is one of your immune, immune cells. Now, what I want to bring your attention to is these kind of, you can see on each side of the T cell, there are these like, these red lines, right? You can see those, right? There's like four sets of these double red lines. So this is um, the mechanism for the way uh, one of the new immunotherapy cancer drugs works. The name of the drug is called nivolumab. Now, I'm not trying to advertise it. <laughs> I'm not associated with any kind of pharmaceutical company. But what I want to illustrate to you is these uh, red lines show basically the way that this drug will help your T cell um, can turn back on so that it can help destroy the cancer cells. So this is amazing. Actually, nivolumab is a kind of artificial antibody. It actually you know, is telling the T cell, look, 
This is a cancer cell. You need to turn back on so you can kill it. <laughs> and because otherwise, your T cell has been turned off, your immune cell has been turned off, and it doesn't destroy the cancer cell. So this drug is saying, no, you've got to turn back on so you can kill the cancer cell. So it's quite amazing. I actually know personally, one of my friends um, actually has uh, kidney cancer. And he had been in, uh, uh, how can I say, he had received over the years many different treatments, uh, chemotherapy, it would work for a while, and then it would stop working. And just recently, he had received uh, this treatment called nivolumab. Um, and the same thing happened, unfortunately. It was working for a while, and then it stopped working. The trade name for nivolumab is, in the US is Opdivo. So he was using this medication, and it's, it was working, and his cancer was uh, re regressing or improving, and then it got worse again. So, you know, this is a promising area of treatment, but it's not perfect, you know. Not everyone who is treated with immunotherapy completely recovers from cancer. What I'm trying to illustrate to you is that our immune system is so important, you know, in the fighting of cancer. So rather than trying to fix it when it's broken, it's better to try to prevent, you know, your immune system from being broken. So keeping your immune system as strong and healthy as possible is one of the best ways to decrease your risk for cancer. This is a similar medication, um, apulumab, and it's also an immunotherapy drug. So same thing. It's trying to um, reactivate your immune system to help it work again uh, so it can destroy cancer cells. Uh, so one other thing I just want to kind of illustrate for you, again, the importance of your immune system in cancer. And the, there's another class of drugs that are being developed where you can see here on the left side, uh, a donor, a healthy donor, gives their blood and then it's kind of uh, filtered out and they give their healthy white blood cells, their healthy immune cells, uh, and then they're taken out and given to a cancer patient. So the thought is, you know, if you can get a, a donor who has healthy immune cells to be donated to a cancer patient, maybe these cells can work to fight the cancer. So this is another class of, you know, medications and therapies that are being developed for cancer. But again, the bottom line to this you can see is, if you have a healthy immune system, that is the best thing. Okay, so here we just have a, this is an electron microscope illustration of, the yellow is a cancer cell, and all the surrounding cells are your white blood cells trying to destroy the cancer cell. So one question is, you know, after hearing all this information, do you really want to change your habits? If you already have good habits, that's wonderful, then you should keep doing what you're doing. But if, you, if you're thinking, yeah, I, I could do better, uh, then the question is, do I want to do better? Do I really want to change? So we talked about inflammation as being important in cancer. So how do we avoid an inflammatory environment? And now, this will be true for cancer, this will be true for Alzheimer's disease, this will be true for heart disease. So here are a few things. I'm going to try to go over them quickly in the interest of time. So one thing is, and I'm going to come back to this in other presentations, you, you want to minimize refined foods. So I will confess to you that um, one of the food groups I love uh, are like breads and pastries and cookies and cakes and things like this. So at times this has been a challenge for me because a lot of these foods are made from refined products, you know, white flour, um, not whole grain flour. So, um, inflammation is well known to be caused by refined foods. So you want to minimize these if you want to avoid an inflammatory environment. Um, they have found that refined foods, among other things, will cause you to have sharp spikes in your insulin levels. This is whether you have diabetes or not, and that can promote inflammation. And inflammation can lead to certain types of cancer. Okay, we've talked about exercise eating fresh fruits and vegetables, whole grains, so not you know, refined foods, 
maintaining an ideal body weight, decreasing saturated fat in your diet, basically decreasing the bad fats. I mean, there are good fats. We talked earlier about avocado is a good fat. Um, stop smoking, don't drink alcohol. So how do we uh, promote an anti-inflammatory environment? Again, eat whole foods. Um, omega-3 fatty acids. I'm going to talk more about this. As, as I was just saying, not all fats are bad. We do need omega-3 fatty acids. Um, they are in many foods. I just the other day learned about black cumin seeds. I understand you have these in the Philippines. Mangoes, you have an abundance here. Green leafy vegetables, cabbage family, uh, beans, beans of many kinds, seaweed, winter squash. All of these foods contain lots of omega-3. And this is just a little, uh, oh, this didn't come out well, but this is an illustration of some of the different types of foods and the amount of omega-3 they contain. Uh, I apologize, some of these didn't come out that well, but. Okay, and then, you know, I actually didn't know what um, mungo beans were. This is a kind of dal. But uh, in the upper left, this, these are mungo beans. I don't know if you have seen these. Yeah, these are kind of just dark black beans, squash. Um, on the lower like left is the black cumin seeds, and on the right is um, chia seeds. OK. Uh, lastly, so I want to just give you a little bit of proof that lifestyle can actually change your risk for cancer, or actually, even if you have cancer, uh, improve your cancer. So in 2005, there was a study done in the Journal of Urology. So urology deals with um, the study and the practice of, um, how can I say, male diseases. So. Dr. Dean Ornish, um, who was formerly at Stanford, um, underwent this, or uh, did this study. He had a group of men who had early prostate cancer. So it wasn't advanced yet, thankfully. And they had different choices. You know, obviously one is don't do anything. Another was have surgery. Another was do chemotherapy. Um, but he said to these men, um, if you're willing, I would like to enroll you in this study, and here's what we will do. So in one group, um, he had them um, have a very distinct lifestyle. So the lifestyle included diet changes. So what they did was they ate a plant-based diet. They ate lots of fruits and vegetables and whole grains um, with soy, it says. And he gave special supplements, vitamin C and E, selenium, these are all antioxidant type supplements, uh, low fat diet for these people, and moderate exercise, stress management, and then a weekly support group. And then the other group, what he did, that was a control group, he just said, okay, um, you can just do whatever you want, <laughs> just a regular lifestyle, your normal lifestyle. So he compared these two groups at the end of the study, after one year. So that was the only change he made. They didn't have surgery, they didn't have chemotherapy or any kind of treatments. Uh, they just changed their lifestyle. At the end of one year, um, they rechecked their, the state of their prostate cancer. So in the, uh, in the group that had the lifestyle changes, they saw a 4% decrease in PSA. So PSA is actually the chemical that is uh, made by the body and is increased when you have prostate cancer. So in this group of patients who had just lifestyle changes, the PSA actually went down. Da and going down is a good thing. You don't want it to go up. But in the other group that, you know, they just lived their normal lifestyle, the PSA went up uh, by 6%. So this just shows that just with lifestyle changes, um, this first group of men were able to decrease the level, you could say almost, of um, this chemical produced by cancer in their body. So actually the difference was about you know, 4% and 6%, about 10% difference uh, just from lifestyle. 
Finally, I want to say, what does the Bible say about our, does the Bible say anything about our health um, and spiritual things? So I have two different verses for you, just for you to consider as we end. So one is from Proverbs. You know, Proverbs was written by the wisest man who ever lived, Solomon. He said, a sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy and, and rottenness, the rottenness of the bones. And then John, the disciple, said in 3 John, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. So here, in both of these verses, you can see that, you know, the Bible talks about how our physical health is related to our spiritual health. You know, God wants us to have... Uh, a connection with him spiritually and that will affect our physical health as well he wants our soul to be healthy and he wants our physical health to be happy and that is my wish for you tonight that you will have both physical health and spiritual health finally um, here, there are many resources I noticed in the Philippines for cancer here are just some of them and also internationally um, so I've covered a lot tonight and I think I've gone over a little bit but thank you for your attention and patience. Tomorrow I will be talking about epigenetics, and I will see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Network.